But the first depiction of a god crucified on a cross was the depiction of Orpheus from the third century before Christ. But sad to say, for a very large part of the world's population today, the central religious symbol is a person impaled in agony on that instrument of torture. It's little wonder that such a system should foster the belief that suffering is inevitable or even desirable and good, and horror of horrors, that it could be in some warped way seen as pleasing to God, and thus allow us to become so indifferent to suffering among the masses of humanity. An empty cross symbolizes the descent of spirit into flesh and celebrates the evolution of that life back into its return. The crucifix, by contrast, only idealizes suffering and death, an attitude which ultimately has to be said is not of God. I want to talk to you about a very controversial subject. Some have gone so far as to say it will shake the foundations of conventional Christianity and all the ways in which we are used to thinking about God. One of the greatest military commanders of all time spoke of Jesus of Nazareth in these words. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander the Great, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I myself have all founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love and at this hour, 18 centuries later, millions of people would still die for him. These are the words of Napoleon Bonaparte when he was in exile in St. Helena a man who well understood the difference between power and force and expressed it memorably in these words. Now what was it that gave Jesus that power? So that it could be so correctly said of him by Dr. James Allen 80 years ago that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of the human race as powerfully as this one man. But the relevance of Jesus does not end with the enormous influence he still undoubtedly holds 20 centuries after he was crucified. The really significant thing about him is that we know he had very definite plans for those who would learn and implement his teachings. And it's very intriguing for you and me that the person who had that kind of power said that all those who followed his teachings would be able to do all the works that he did and greater still. But where is the evidence of this happening in world Christianity today? Nowhere. Why is the evidence not there? The obvious answer must be that his teachings have neither been understood properly or followed. And the immediate consequence of that is to suspect 
that who he really was has never been understood either. If this is the case, then truly an investigation into these matters is something that really could shake the foundations of Christianity in its conventional form today and all the ways in which we have grown so accustomed to think about God. Now, what do we really know about the life of Jesus? Few people doubt that Jesus of Nazareth was one of the really great, pivotal figures in the whole of human history. The billions who revere his name today bear eloquent testimony to the truth of that. The nations who dominate the world today in political power and economics all claim their inspiration from his teachings. But it's extraordinary that for a person who has had such an enormous influence over two millennia, it's extraordinary that we know so little about himself. We have no idea at all from the Christian New Testament of what he may have looked like. We have no record that he ever wrote anything, though assuredly he must have. But if he did write something, it has not survived. The details of his personal life are few and far between. Most of what we know about him comes from the four so-called canonical Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But however undoubtedly important they may be as sources, it is very obvious that they were not interested in providing details of even a rudimentary biography of Jesus. Now most biblical scholars today would date those four Gospels as having been written between the years 60 to 110 AD. However, the earliest manuscripts we have of any of them in a complete sense is from the 4th century, even though a few fragments of them date back to the 2nd century. There are a few references to Jesus from sources outside the New Testament and from outside the so-called Gnostic Gospels and letters, but they are just mentions in passing. Flavius Josephus, the famous Jewish historian who wrote the book called The Antiquities of the Jews, in the early 90s of our era, records the death of James, whom he refers to as the brother of Jesus. Another passage that refers to Jesus is considered by some to be an insertion by early Christians of a later time, or at least something that has been elaborated on by Christians of a later time, because it most certainly would not have come from Josephus himself, who was as far as could be imagined from being a Christian. Pliny the Younger wrote to the Emperor Trajan in the year 111, asking for directions on how to deal with Christians, who he said sang, quote, hymns to Christ as a God. The historian Tacitus, writing about the year 116, describes the great fire of Rome in the days of Nero in the year 64 and of how Nero tried to pin the blame for the burning of the city on, quote, the persons commonly called Christians, unquote. He states that Christus, the founder of that name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius Caesar. The Roman historian Suetonius records the expulsion of the Jews from Rome after disturbances instigated by Crestus, that's from his life of Claudius. And some consider that that possibly might be a reference to Jesus, which I do not.
Now, that's all the evidence that there is for a person who exercised such a magnificent influence on two millennia of history. It's very little information on which to go. Copies of 52 ancient Christian texts were discovered at Nag Hammadi in Lower Egypt in 1945. These copies dated from about the year 350, according to dating done on their bindings. The documents themselves are obviously much earlier than the copies. And this collection, which was very likely buried in a time of censorship and persecution of these so-called Gnostic texts and their Gnostic readers, shows clearly that the number of sacred texts that were held in high regard and which spoke of the life and mission of Jesus was at that time far more extensive than what is now contained in the Christian New Testament. And their message about Jesus was also quite different from how the New Testament speaks about him. The phenomenal success of the novel The Da Vinci Code is eloquent witness to how the message of these texts can arouse such passion on both sides, even today. The originals of at least some of these documents very likely go back to the time of the apostles themselves. And I have in mind principally the Gospel of Thomas, which all recognize as being the most significant find of the Nag Hammadi texts. The documents from Nag Hammadi convey a very different picture of Jesus from that which is contained in the New Testament. The Gospel of Thomas contains teachings of Jesus that are couched in a much earlier form than the form in which the teachings are expressed in the New Testament. And the Gospel of Thomas contains a lot of other teachings that are not found in the New Testament at all. The Gospel of Thomas itself is recognized as the principal find from Nag Hammadi. And it describes itself as recording the secret teachings of Jesus, which were not given out to his audiences at large, but were reserved for those who had proven themselves. If this is so, what did these teachings say? It seems from the Gospel of Thomas that these teachings were designed to help the hearers become what Jesus himself was. And in that their focus is remarkably different from the teachings of Jesus contained in the Christian New Testament. But of course we don't depend on the Gospel of Thomas alone for information about secret teachings of Jesus that were not to be given out until significant advances had been made in the application of the public teachings. In 1958, Professor Morton Smith at the monastery of Mar Saba in the Judean desert found fragments of what purported to be a secret gospel of Mark. It was included inside a medieval book and allegedly was a letter from Clement of Alexandria who died about the year 215 AD. It spoke vehemently of the necessity of keeping the secret teachings of Jesus hidden from the ordinary herd of believers. Now much of the distortion about Jesus that has taken place in popular devotion today is not at all unrelated to how little we actually are told about him in the four Gospels of the New Testament. Even at this basic stage, we begin to find strong indications that we were not told all that there was to know about Jesus by the New Testament. And maybe we were not told at all 
about the really significant material. One thing is for certain. What records we are now uncovering convey a picture of Jesus and his teachings that is poles apart from the saccharine sweet figure of popular piety that we all heard about in our childhood. The gentle Jesus, meek and mild picture. How could anyone ever expect that this description could fit a person who never hesitated to level the greatest insult at the Pharisees that a Jew could voice when he called them a brood of vipers. This to a people who abhorred the serpent. He publicly called the devious King Herod a fox. And he had such power of personality that he could walk unharmed through a murderous mob intent on hurling him to his death over a cliff. The civil authorities of his day considered him a public danger to the state. He was in truth what an earlier Christian tradition loved to call him, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. What happened? Now when we look at the sum total of these fragmentary pieces, or of what we are told about the life of Jesus in the New Testament, we find a fair amount of discussion concerning the time and the circumstances of his birth. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke both give his genealogy, but with significant differences. Matthew's genealogy, which was concerned to show that Jesus as the Messiah had descended from King David, lists 42 individuals in the genealogy in descending order, beginning with Abraham right down to Jesus himself. While St. Luke, who wished to show that Jesus was the Son of God, lists 77 names in ascending order. And almost half of those names are entirely unknown in history otherwise. Now it's been suggested that Matthew is giving the ancestry of Joseph, the father of Jesus, and Luke, the ancestor of his mother Mary. And of course that's a neat solution. And neat solutions are rarely true. But the opposite has been argued as well. The Eastern Orthodox Church and the Coptic Church of Egypt that goes back to the very beginnings of Christianity accept that Luke is giving us Mary, the mother of Jesus' genealogy. I remember years ago down in Florida, my old friend, the eminent biblical scholar Raymond Brown, said to me when I was trying to help him read the proofs of his latest book, he said, the trouble with trying to combine these two genealogies and make sense of them in that way is that Jesus ends up with too many grandfathers. However, having too many grandfathers is the least of the problems that arise from the New Testament in relation to Jesus today. The infancy gospel of the New Testament tells us that the Holy Family had to flee into Egypt to escape the persecution of King Herod. King Herod the Great, Antipas, his son was also Antipas, who wanted to kill Jesus because he was a possible claimant to his throne. Now Herod the Great, who rebuilt the temple of Solomon, was a puppet king who had been placed by the Romans in the year 63 BC on a very, very shaky throne. 
And to complicate matters further, he was an Arab, not a Jew. In an attempt to consolidate his power, Herod married Mariamna, the last princess in the direct line of the Hasmonean dynasty, which he had replaced. The Hasmoneans had descended from Judas Maccabeus, the great hero who had freed Judea in 136 BC from the Seleucid rulers of Syria, who were descended from one of the main generals of the army of Alexander the Great. However, in 63 BC, the Romans took advantage of a civil war between rival claimants to the throne of Judea, and they placed Herod on the throne of the Hasmoneans. Mary Magdalene was also of that royal family, as early Christian testimony can show. The entire background of Mary Magdalene as a Hasmonean princess is not touched on at all by the Da Vinci Code, but yet is part of the central reality of what she was. This background and her relationship to Jesus, both of the members of the Judean royal families, will be the subject of a later DVD which I will do in this series. Now, Herod the Great would obviously have been greatly troubled by the birth of a child with a claim to the throne of David, as Jesus had, and as the genealogies in the Gospels are at pains to show. This is why the Holy Family had to flee into Egypt to escape his persecution. We are told nothing about what the Holy Family did while they were in Egypt. And after the return of Jesus from Egypt, we hear nothing more about him from St. Luke until he is in the temple at Passover for his bar mitzvah, presumably at the age of 12. After this incident, we are told he went down with his parents and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And we are told that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 51-52. To the alert and the perceptive, it's a classic cover-up, if there was ever one. So we have two large gaps in the life story of Jesus. They're not insignificant gaps. The first gap relates to the time they spent in Egypt. At least we know from the Gospels that they did go to Egypt. But how long they spent there and what they did there, we are not told in the New Testament. Likewise, the New Testament tells us nothing about what happened when they returned from exile, or whether they had been two years or eight years, as various traditions attest. The very next piece of information we are given is when Jesus is in the temple at 12 years of age. What happened in between? Now, after the incident in the temple at age 12, there comes the second big gap in the record. We don't hear a single other word about what Jesus did between the ages of 12 and the time when he appeared at the Jordan to be baptized by his cousin John at the age of 30. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, 18 years is not a short time, especially in an entire lifespan of 33 years. It was longer than the rest of his entire life. What did he do in these 18 years, which is more than half his lifetime? There's been a deathly silence about that in Christian history. <laughs> 
Did he go down to Nazareth, as the New Testament tells us, and work in the carpenter shop with Joseph, as the tradition tells us, presumably making tables and chairs and bird feeders? If that were the case, then I would heartily recommend the taking up of carpentry for all of us. Because when he had emerged from that alleged carpenter shop apprenticeship, he was able to heal the sick, raise the dead, walk on water, and feed 5,000 people with five loaves and a few fish. But I think the truth is a little more complicated and a little more interesting than that. Is there a reason why we have no information at all about Jesus during these two big information gaps in his life? Is it because nothing of significance happened at all in those hidden years? A total of perhaps 26 to 28 years out of a complete life of 33 years. It's not an insignificant segment of his life, to put it mildly. Or is the truth rather that something very significant was happening in those years that the powers that be do not want you to know about now any more than they wanted people to know about in the early years of Christianity? More than 80% of the life of Jesus is missing from the New Testament. More than 80%. Maybe the trip to the carpenter shop in Nazareth never took place at all. Maybe there is a whole facet of Jesus that is entirely different from what we knew previously and about which we are now only coming to learn. And perhaps the facet of those 18 years will shed an enormous light on what he came to do later in those crucial two and a half years or three years of public ministry in the Holy Land. Just as his two stays in Egypt will shed a lot of light and understanding on it as well. It will revolutionize how we understand him and what he came to do and how that message is relevant to you and me today. Because this is of enormous importance, not just for Christians, but for every person who has a human body. And this information truly is something that can rock the foundations of conventional Christianity because it deserves to be rocked. This is why there have been so many uproars about the matters raised in a novel like the Da Vinci Code. So let's first look at the gap in his life story between the ages of 12 and 30 years, 18 years. And our story hinges on a Russian aristocrat called Nicholas Notovich, who published a book in French in 1894 called The Unknown Life of Jesus. Notovich had set out on the great journey at the end of the Russian-Turkish War, about 1878, to explore Eastern Europe and the Middle and the Far East. Notovich reached India, Nepal, Tibet, and Little Tibet, called Ladakh, in the year 1887. Now, Notovich was interested in studying the customs and history of the people and the geography of that magnificent landscape near the Himalayas. He had no interest in religion. I stress that because I want you to be clear about his motives in going there. Notovich heard many times during his journeys in Tibet 
that there were scrolls in existence, not just one set, but several sets of scrolls in existence, that spoke of the life of Jesus in India during his teenage years. Nodovich eventually arrived at a monastery called Hemus, about 25 miles outside the city of Leh, the capital of Ladek. He found a monastery. The monastery of Hemus is hidden away in a remote valley at an altitude of more than 11,000 feet above sea level. And its remote location has preserved it from the unwelcome attentions of several conquering armies down the centuries. Nodovich claimed that he was shown a copy at Hemus of an ancient Buddhist manuscript which described the life of Jesus from his teenage years up to the age of 26 and that this section of his life had been lived in India and Tibet. Nodovich was told that there were scrolls there containing the account of what Jesus did during those years. At first, he wasn't successful in being able to see the scrolls. The lamas were very reticent about showing them to strangers. But as luck would have it, after he had set out on his return journey, he broke his leg and he had to be taken back to the monastery for emergency treatment. But during his short convalescence there, he became friendly with some of the lamas. And having won their confidence, he was eventually shown the scrolls. Now according to Nodovich, the scrolls were in two large bound volumes written in the Tibetan language. There were translations, not the original, which was in the ancient language of Pali, the language of the Buddha Gautama. He had the scrolls translated for him as one of the lamas read them aloud by Nodovich's own Tibetan translator and interpreter. The interpreter rendered them into French. Now the account of the life of Jesus which Nodovich found was scattered throughout the volumes in no particular sequence. Nodovich collected the relevant verses together and put them in chronological order, the order that he knew of the life of Jesus. When he came back to Europe, he tried to publish the account of what Jesus was said to have done in India and Tibet and in Kashmir in those years under the title The Life of St. Isa, I-S-S-A best of the sons of men. It was a short booklet consisting only of 244 verses. The account in those scrolls was allegedly written down three to four years after the crucifixion of Jesus and was based on the testimony of merchants from India who had witnessed the event personally. Once Nodovich had returned to Europe, the saga that preceded the publication of the material started to emerge. It's very interesting, and it certainly does not seem to be something that would have occurred if the documents had been regarded as a fiction by those who were told about them in Europe. He had been counseled against publishing them by the Archbishop of Kiev. A cardinal in Rome, unfortunately unnamed, who was close to the Pope, Leo XIII, tried to dissuade him from publishing the translation of the scrolls, and the cardinal offered to buy his notes from him if he was short of money. Needless to say, Nodovich declined the offer. He was discouraged at Paris by a Cardinal Rotelli. All these names check out. 
Cardinal Rotelli was not, as you might expect, the Archbishop of Paris, but the nuncio of the Pope in France. He had served previously in a lesser capacity in the Vatican diplomatic service in Constantinople, Istanbul today, where Nodovic had previously met him. Cardinal Rotelli said that the Church had suffered enough from hostile criticism already and asked what would this story do to Christianity if it became public knowledge. It's hardly the reaction of a man who believed the scrolls were fraudulent. In Paris, Nodovich next met Monsieur Jules Simon. Simon introduced him to Monsieur Ernest Renan, the great French writer and author of one of the first really great scholarly lives of Jesus. Renan offered to present the writings to the French Academy, but Nodovic felt that Renan would get all the credit for the scrolls, while he himself would only be recognized marginally as the one who had found them. So Nodovic decided to publish them himself, which he did the year following, after Renan had died. Now the publication, as you might expect, was a great success. Have you ever heard of these publications before? I certainly hadn't. That says something as well. Eight editions of the book appeared in France within the first year and three English versions appeared in the United States straight away. But in religious terms, Nodovich became one of the most hated men in Europe when the work became known. Because so much that's contained in that short booklet challenges the bastions of die-hard orthodoxy in so many religions. The attacks began almost immediately. And of course there were allegations made that he had never been in India or in Tibet. Some claimed that Nodovic had never visited Hema's monastery. And they even denied that there was any such place and therefore obviously no such scrolls. In October 1894, very soon after the publication, Professor Max Muller, Professor of Modern European Languages and Comparative Philology at Oxford University, who had translated the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads first into English, a noted Orientalist. He took up the cudgels against Nodovich in an article published in the magazine 19th Century. Muller was convinced that Nodovich's life of Jesus was a fraud, and he didn't even feel certain that Nodovich had ever been in Tibet, much less in the monastery of Hemus. Nodovic responded fully to Muller's arguments in his preface to the English edition of the scrolls, which appeared in 1895, the following year. Muller had said, for instance, that this alleged book published by Nodovic, if it really had existed, should have been listed in the two great catalogues in which all Tibetan literature is supposed to be entered, the Kanjur and the Tanjur. But Nodovic replied that the verses he had published would not be found listed in any catalogue precisely because they were to be found scattered in many different scrolls and places in the scrolls interspersed with information on very many other topics and without any formal title to identify them. Muller also claimed to have received a letter from a lady who had visited the Hemus Monastery shortly after the publication of Nodovich's book. She said the Lamas had told her they had never heard of Nodovich or indeed of any unknown life of Jesus written about in scrolls that were held there at Hemus. Nodovic replied that Tibetans had grown wise as a result of unpleasant experiences with Westerners. <laughs>
And when conquering Europeans asked about any literary treasures of the monastery, they rightly suspected that it was because they wanted to take them away with them permanently, and they had suffered such losses in the past. Now, a little background might be interesting here. The renowned Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama, who sailed around the Cape of Good Hope and established a trade route between Portugal and the East, he arrived on the east coast of India in the closing years of the 1400s, quote, with an unusual combination of equipment, gunboats and priests. The Pope of the day, who obviously felt it was his right, had divided the world between the Spanish and the Portuguese. And the East had been allotted to the Portuguese in that division. Now for the Indians, it was the first outside contact with the teachings of Jesus since Thomas the Apostle had come there a millennium and a half before. Vasco da Gama found 20 trading ships in the harbor of Calicut when he arrived there. It was a city greater than his own native city of Lisbon in Europe. He plundered them and took 800 prisoners. He then ordered that their hands, ears, and noses should be hacked off. And all of the amputated pieces were piled into a boat. The Brahmin, who had been sent out by the head of the city, the Zamorin, to negotiate with the Gama, was treated in the same fashion, and was then sent back with the mutilated pieces together with a note from Vasco da Gama advising the Zamorin to make curry with the human pieces in the boat. When the Zamorin sent another Brahmin to plead for peace with da Gama, that emissary had his lips cut off and his ears. The ears of a dog were sewn on to him and the Brahman was sent back in that state. The Brahman had brought with him three young boys, two of which were his own sons, and the other his nephew. The children were hanged from the yard arm of the ship, and the bodies sent back to the town. This was a sad reacquaintance with those who professed allegiance to the teachings of Jesus. Within decades of the arrival of the Europeans, according to their own records, they had destroyed 601 temples in 131 villages. The Franciscan friars, who unfortunately claimed as their patron Francis of Assisi, destroyed 300 Hindu temples in Bardez, and the Jesuits destroyed 280 in Salsete. Francis Xavier, whom the Catholic Church reveres as the patron saint of the East, wrote back to headquarters, I quote, As soon as I arrive in any heathen village, when all are baptized, I order all of their temples to the false gods to be destroyed, and all of their idols to be broken to pieces. I can give you no idea, he said, of the joy I feel in seeing this done." Unquote. The Fathers of the Church forbade the Hindus under terrible penalties to use their own sacred books and forbade the exercise of their own religion. The temples were destroyed and they were forbidden under threat of imprisonment, torture or death 
to worship after the fashion of the God of their fathers. These are the words of Sassetti, who was in India from 1578 to 1588. It was an unfortunate reacquaintance indeed for the people of India with the teachings of Jesus, first brought to their shores by Thomas the Apostle. The tales of these atrocities spread throughout the length and breadth of the subcontinent, and it helps to explain the later deep distrust they felt in meetings with Westerners. All of this is very relevant to the investigation of the claims of Nodovich and the visitors to the monastery of Hemus that followed the publication of his book. You can only imagine the apprehension that the head of a remote monastery would feel when confronted with an eminent British official at a time when Christian British power in India was at its height and when the topics the scrolls were supposed to deal with threatened the whole foundation on which Christianity erected its view of itself as the only true religion. J. Archibald Douglas, who was a professor in the Government College at Agra, India, the city where the Taj Mahal is found, read Nodovich's book shortly after its publication. He took a three-month vacation from the college and set out for the Hemus Monastery to try to get to the bottom of the matter. He claimed to have met the chief Lama at Hemus, who once again disclaimed all knowledge of anybody called Nodovich and of the existence of any scrolls. A Moravian Christian mission official from the Moravian mission in the town of Leh, which as I said earlier was 25 miles from the Hemus monastery, a Moravian mission official called Brother Weber also wrote about Nodovich. Initially, he decided Nodovich had ever been in Leh. Nobody had heard of him, he said. But the two Moravians who had met Nodovich had died in 1891, Brother Redslob and Dr. K. Marx. However, much to his regret, Brother Weber later found an entry in the mission diary that confirmed that Nodovich had visited Leh at the time he said. You can view the page of the mission diary that records Notovich's visit. The first picture I'm showing you shows the photograph of the handwritten entry. And the second picture, which has an area highlighted in yellow, is a translation of the section referring to Notovich as NN, Nicholas Notovich. Now, Nodovich's book was republished in New York in 1926, and that inspired Professor Edgar J. Goodspeed of the University of Chicago to publish another attack on the book on behalf of Christianity. He said it was claimed the scrolls were said to have been written within a few years after the crucifixion of Jesus, but he said they seemed to depend on material about Jesus from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke and from the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistle to the Romans, which were not written until decades after the crucifixion. Goodspeed quite correctly says that Nodovich was in error in quoting Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 80. Quote, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his manifestation to Israel. Now, Nodovich said this text proved conclusively that no one knew where Jesus was until he suddenly reappeared 16 years later. Unfortunately for Nodovich's effort, Jesus had not yet appeared in St. Luke's Gospel at this point, and the reference is to his cousin John, not to Jesus. Now, of course, Nodovich's imperfect knowledge of Scripture doesn't count as an argument against the legitimacy of the scrolls. And the brute fact remains that there is nothing in the New Testament about Jesus for more than 80% of his life. Nor is there a single sentence 
in any of the four Gospels written by anyone who knew him personally. Of course, we don't depend on Nodovich alone for evidence of the existence of the Isha Scrolls, as they are called, because the name that Jesus was known by in the scrolls of Notovich was Isa. Swami Abhidnanda, who was a disciple of Ramakrishna, had read Notovich's book while he lived in America. And in 1922, he eventually had the opportunity to travel to the monastery of Hemus himself with the intention of refuting Notovich's story as a complete hoax. However, when he explained the purpose of his visit to the Lamas at Hemus, quite contrary to the reception that the great Western power figure Archibald Douglas had received, the Lamas did confirm that Notovich had been at the monastery of Hemus and that he had been shown the scrolls about the life of Esa. Abad Nanda was shown a manuscript which he was told, as Notovich had, was a translation of, a, of an original document into Tibetan, the original being in Pali, and which was held in a monastery at Marbur near Lhasa. Abad Nanda made his own translation of the scrolls and later published them. They were published in Bengali. Elizabeth Clare Prophet did have the translation converted into English, and I have compared the two English translations very carefully, that of Notovich and that from the Journal of Abednanda. They are obviously two different translations of the same material. There's no doubt about that. However, it is noteworthy that Abednanda omits the sections of Nodovich's scrolls in which Jesus trenchantly criticizes the Vedas, the sacred writings, and in which he criticizes Buddhism and Hinduism. That's omitted from Abhidnanda's version. The fact that this material that's so critical of the most sacred writings in India is contained in those scrolls makes it extremely unlikely that this is material which a Buddhist or a Hindu would have faked. Dr. Nicholas Rorich, the famous Russian artist and scholar, who was, nated, who was nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1928 and who has a museum of his work in Manhattan today, had visited Hemus in 1925 along with his wife and his son George, who spoke fluent Tibetan. And he published his testimony that the belief that Jesus had lived in India was widespread everywhere he went, though obviously the natives were extremely reluctant to voice that abroad too much for fear of offending the powerful Westerners who controlled their destinies. In 1939, just before World War II, Madame Elizabeth Kaspari, the renowned Swiss musician and friend of the great educationalist Maria Montessori, went to Hemus with Mrs. Clarence Gask, who was then head of the World Fellowship of Faith. They had no previous knowledge of Notovich, and they had never heard of his scrolls. But one day, quite unexpectedly during their stay at the monastery, the librarian and two other monks came to them and presented three manuscripts to them, covered in ornate silk, which they then unwrapped. The librarian then said to them, These books say that your Jesus was here. Madame Kaspari photographed the librarian displaying the scrolls, and I include the photograph in this DVD. the longest serving member ever of the United States Supreme Court, Justice William O. Douglas, visited the Hemus Monastery in 1951 
And he testified in his book, Beyond the High Himalayas, that the people there believed that Jesus had visited Hemus and that the legends described his stay in Tibet in some detail. Dr. Robert Rovich, professor of anthropology at California State University, went to Hemus in 1975 and was told by a friend who was an eminent local physician in, in Leh that there were documents at the monastery which stated that Jesus had been there. And in the late 1970s, Edward F. Novak was a guest at Hemus when a monk assured him that a scroll telling of Jesus' life in India was locked in their storeroom. Finally, Sri Dayamata, who was president of the Self-Realization Fellowship, went to India in 1959 she interviewed one of the chief spiritual leaders of India, Sri Bharati Krishna Tirtha. He stated to her that Jesus had indeed spent time in India, and he asserted that he himself had studied ancient records in the Puri Jagannath Temple archives, which confirmed these facts. Puri is southwest of present-day Calcutta, so we're no longer dealing with Tibet and its uncertain destinies after the communist occupations, but a temple that is still there and functioning fully in present-day India. Now, why was there this enormous controversy over Nicholas Nodovich's discovery, and why was there such a frenzy to try to disprove his claims? To understand the acrimony that his information produced, we need to go back and review some of the ideas that I discussed in the first DVD of this series. It was called The Hamburger Universe. And that will help us to understand the immense re repercussions of this information of Nodovich for the conventional Christian world. As you may recall from that first DVD in this series, I conjured up a humorous image about ten years ago to describe the way in which the average person thinks about God and our relationship to him. Always, of course, a him. That image that I conjured up I called the hamburger universe. It arises from our propensity to identify God as living up there in the heavens. So when we pray to God, we instinctively look up The people in Australia look in the opposite direction. We end up with this image that God's abode in heaven is above us. The earth is in the middle and the underworld of hell, purgatory and limbo is beneath. Now we very rightly laugh at the ways in which we so crudely think about what God is, what our purpose in this life is, and what we may expect after death. We even more rightly ought to laugh at the mawkish and sentimental ways in which we picture heaven as on the top floor of the hamburger universe. And we should most certainly laugh at the bizarre notion of a hell of eternal torments consisting of freezing wastes or lakes of burning fire which we are rather inexplicably asked to accept was created by a God whose nature is infinite love. What do we unconsciously assume that God is like? Unconsciously is the word to be stressed. If elephants were to think about God, presumably they would think of God as an elephant. Ants would most likely think of God as an insect. So I suppose it ought to come as no great surprise to us that human beings follow suit and try to picture God as a person, as a human being. He 
of course, is suitably enlarged and purged of the obvious human limitations, but is still a human being. This is how we think about God, and this is not what God is. In fact, in some religious traditions today, God is pictured as quite a nasty person who needs to be constantly placated by obedience and worship. And as far as we can tell, he has been that way as far back as records go. Now, God most assuredly is not a human person, enlarged. Nor do we much improve matters by calling God she, rather than he, or it. For all of these categories, male, female, and neutral, belong to those planes of existence that we inhabit, and which God, as we conceive of him, does not inhabit. These are hamburger universe ideas. Within the limits of our poverty-stricken, thoughts, words, and ideas, God is much more accurately seen as a verb rather than as a noun, much more as an all-pervading, powerful, personal, and conscious energy rather than as some sort of fearsome overlord modeled on the sultans and potentates of the ancient Near East who sits in judgment on a throne above the clouds. Now it's not the hamburger universe images that we find funny that do the damage, but rather the hamburger universe misconceptions about many other fundamental realities of which we are not even aware that we have. These unconscious presuppositions are the fatal ones which will, will wreck our hopes of spiritual evolution. And that's what I was concerned to demonstrate in the first DVD of this series. As recently as 400 years ago, most of the Western world somewhat grudgingly came round to accept that this planet Earth was not at the geographical centre of everything. Since then, of course, we have suffered repeated aftershocks in the form of realizing that matters are much more serious than we thought. Far from being at the center of everything, we realize that this solar system is not at the center of anything in particular. In fact, we are in the very boondocks of the Milky Way galaxy, which is itself a rather remote rural galaxy on the fringes of the universe. We're not exactly living in prime real estate here. It certainly gives us no basis for the exalted conception of ourselves, which we unquestionably assume. But despite all of these aftershocks we have suffered, our arrogance persists. We still cling to the idea that we are at the center of everything in some other shape or form. And now the way that Jesus is normally understood by conventional religion is at the very heart of this problem. Because we try to bolster up our uniqueness as a race by reflecting that even if we do live in the boondocks of the universe, we nevertheless must be mighty special and unique, because God sent his one and only Son down from the top floor of the Hamburger universe to save us. What an extraordinary idea. Haven't we always needed to believe that we are the only race of intelligent beings that exists in the whole vastness of even the visible universe, such as we can see now through the Hubble telescope? Is it possible for us to even realize the depth of arrogance that's needed to think in that way? Here we are in the boondocks of the Milky Way, a remote rural galaxy. And we've very successfully persuaded ourselves that we are the only people that God 
could ever have made. And furthermore, that we have been the sole beneficiaries of God's undivided attention since the human race was first created. And all of that, of course, culminated in God sending down his one and only son from the top floor of the hamburger universe to save us. Save us from what? I've studied all of this carefully, very carefully. And I can only conclude that the primary thing from which we need protection and salvation is precisely the savage God of the hamburger universe. And if that savage God were not there, I doubt we would need the salvation at all. I mean, what is there to be said for this view of things? There's nothing to be said for it. So we have this incredible arrogance about needing to believe how central we are in God's design. And you have only to suggest to people, just merely to suggest to them, that there possibly might be some possibility of intelligent life elsewhere. If only to suggest that, to find out how much it pushes their buttons. And then, of course, immediately on comes the ridicule, the persecution and the scorn. 400 years is not a long time in the course of human history. That is precisely how long it has been since Father Giordano Bruno was imprisoned and tortured for seven years by the Inquisition at Rome. And then he was, quote, roasted alive by order of the Pope. What offense had this man committed to undergo such a gruesome death? Was he an axe murderer? Or someone who had perpetrated terrible crimes against humanity? No, this is the statement that brought him to his death, I quote. Innumerable suns exist. Innumerable earths revolve around those suns in a manner similar to the way in which the seven planets revolve around our sun. Living beings inhabit those worlds. That's from Bruno's book, The Infinite Universe and Its Worlds, published in London in 1548, while he was attending the court of Elizabeth I. Now, nothing pushes many people's buttons more than the very suggestion that there might possibly be intelligent life elsewhere other than on this earth. That's a very intriguing phenomenon. Why should it be? Of course it is. Because if we find that there is intelligent life elsewhere, then we have to surrender our place of superiority on the top of the downhill. Not to mention the awful thought that if intelligent life abounds throughout the universe, there's the very real possibility that far from being God's unique and most advanced special people, we might actually find that we are, by comparison, relatively primitive and unevolved. That is something the human race is most assuredly not ready to accept. Now we have to give up the pompous and self-flattering idea that Jesus Christ came down here to save us as God's only Son. We have to abandon the idea that if life were ever discovered on other planets, that we would have to try to devise some means of going to save them. As the religious director of a very famous observatory in the United States went so far as to publicly pronounce in 1997, 
No, 400 years is not a long time in human history. But that's only how long it's been since these unspeakable barbarities in the name of religion were perpetrated. And what's more, they were perpetrated precisely in those regions of the world that prided themselves on being at the forefront of civilization. But even though the burnings have stopped, unfortunately the same inquisitorial mind persists, which can see nothing odd or wrong with trying to ensure compliance with one's version of the truth by force. The truth, of course, is seen in the perspective of the hamburger universe. You know, the Emperor Constantine really set a very bad precedent after the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, when he yielded to the request of the victorious theological camp and banished those bishops into exile who would not think and vote correctly about the main item on their agenda, that is, who Jesus really was. And unfortunately, the former persecuted and fugitive church has never quite unlearned that lesson to this very day. It's the mindset of an armed doctrine which tries to compel adherence to its beliefs by force and threat. And in so doing, ends up in the rather curious situation of preaching and practicing hatred in the name of the God of love. Fortunately today, there is no longer a stake waiting for those who dare to hold a different view from the majority. But of course there are other forms of stakes, as all the people well know who have ever tried to march to a different drummer, who have ever tried to raise an innocent question about whether this or that statement may be an expression of the full truth or not, or whether we need to examine matters further. Oh yes, there are other kinds of stakes. And when you dare to disagree, rest assured you will not be engaged on the high levels of theology and philosophy. No, they will attack you in the lowest possible way, in the very shrewd but ultimately vain hope that if you are discredited, then they needn't bother about your message. It's the easiest way of all. And it totally escapes, of course, any need for the evaluation of whatever scientific or objective evidence there may be, which these organizations are normally completely reluctant to face. These are the consequences of the mindset of the hamburger universe. Religion has a deeply vested interest in that mindset. In fact, the hamburger universe mindset really is the mindset of religion. I have mentioned just three of these consequences and the inquisitorial mind which tries to sustain these views of reality. But the fourth casualty of the hamburger universe creates what is in many ways the most serious situation of all for us and the one which has provoked most reaction, controversy and persecution down the years. It has to do with Jesus. Jesus, even more than God, has been the victim of the Hamburger Universe mindset all down the centuries. The God of the Hamburger Universe is not the true God. It's somebody else's picture of God, and it has nothing to do with the real thing. Likewise, the Jesus that has been purveyed for us down all these centuries since the time of his mission, is not the real Jesus. It's a Jesus that has been manipulated and honed to suit very many agendas. And this is the reason why the power to which Napoleon Bonaparte referred, which I quoted at the start, is so little in evidence in those who follow the idol of Jesus rather than the real thing.
of all the topics that arouses the ire of the inquisitorial mind, Jesus stands at the very top of the list. And so it is that religious organizations for millennia have fed very distorted images of Jesus to their congregations. They've been carefully honed, edited, manipulated to suit the needs of these religious organizations at particular times in history. And those who dare to say, this is not the way it was, or there is more to the story than this, why the whole course of human history has been littered with their corpses, with their imprisonments, with their banishments, their ostracisms, and their branding as heretics all down the ages. It's indeed a brave and rare person who decides to proclaim something about Jesus that is not politically in accordance with the status quo of the time. For wrong thinking about Jesus has always been regarded as the ultimate form of heresy. Against that background in this presentation, I want to look at two major issues about Jesus that are of extreme relevance to us today. The first issue concerns the dominant way in which the Christian religions understand Jesus and what he accomplished in his life on earth. And the second issue has to do with the vexed question of what happened in all those missing years of the life of Jesus since in the New Testament we are told nothing about more than 80% of his life. So what's the most popular picture of Jesus that we are presented with by the Christian religions today? Now sermons delivered in church or popular hymns are not bad places to look first in an investigation like this. Most people think sermons are far too long, and usually they are. But however long they may be, they're usually far too short to do justice to the reality about which they speak. For instance, most devout Christian belief in Jesus today is in fact quite heretical. Because the average Christian thinks of Jesus as a divine person who was somehow pretending to be a human being, but was not really. It's called the heresy of Docetism, one of the really major threats to the faith of the early Christian church. So Jesus in popular instruction is usually encapsulated in stock phrases. And one of the most obvious ways in which the person and message of Jesus has been manipulated by the churches is in how he has been converted into a suffering saviour or redeemer, which gripped a hold of the Christian imagination right from the first moment it was imposed on the reality of the Christ. He is God's only son who came down for me to this earth, parachuted, as some sort of paratrooper directly by God onto this earth? Why? To suffer and to die for my sins in reparation. Why? Ow! Who thought of this? What had it to do with what Jesus really was about? Why did people think of Jesus in this way? Presumably because he could endure more intense suffering as a divine person than an ordinary human being could. Presumably God had been so offended that only the suffering of a divine person could make up to him for the insults his creatures had offered. So Jesus died for my sins on the cross, we're told. My soul is bathed in the blood of the Lamb, shed for my offenses. I am redeemed through his passion. I'm inclined to think that the person who would be most surprised to hear all of this would be Jesus himself. 
Now this is the way Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, depicts him. While that movie is generally accurate to the known sources in describing what Jesus endured, unfortunately it misses the entire point of what Jesus was really about. This picturing of the suffering Christ, the Christ with the crown of thorns, the blood pouring down his face, the stumbling Christ on the way to Calvary, and then with nails driven through his wrists and his feet, and the spear through his side. This tortured Jesus is all that he is for most people in today's Christian world. I was shocked, I'm not easily shocked, but I was shocked once five years ago in South Africa when I went there to speak at a parliament for the conference of, a world, of world religions. And I discovered, to my horror, that within the Christian fold today, there are more than 20,000 different churches, denominations and congregations that claim to follow the message of Jesus. Several of them claiming to be the only true interpretation of that message and the suffering Saviour unfortunately is almost always at the heart of their message. But has anyone ever asked where does all this come from? Where did this image of the suffering Jesus come from and why has it come to utterly dominate the centre stage today? How much has it to do with the real Jesus? who lived and walked on this earth 2,000 years ago. Was this suffering what he really came to do? Or is there an entirely different explanation that in no way detracts from the magnificence and the greatness of what Jesus was? This image of the suffering Redeemer has become so closely intertwined with the Christian message that now it's almost impossible to think of Christianity in any other terms or indeed to think of Jesus without the blood, the gore and the torture and the suffering. That's what he's been converted into. Quickly in its footsteps of course comes the guilt and the unworthiness that it arouses in us all because we've all been taught that we are the ones who caused it. Jesus took our burdens and our blame and our retribution upon himself. And look at the result. We are never allowed to forget our guilt and the remorse we should feel. And there are items available all over the internet that keep those images fixed before our minds from the cradle to the grave. Babies' garments, baseball hats, school notebooks, coffee mugs, and even dogs' blankets. Jesus took our burdens and our blame and our retribution upon himself. And look at the result. If I believe that I've caused this enormous suffering to descend upon Jesus, he took my burdens on himself, I am immediately going to feel an enormous rush of guilt and unworthiness. And unfortunately, that is precisely the single matter that dominates most religious sentiment today. And it's also the single greatest block for any of us who follow Jesus to replicating in our own persons that power of which Napoleon Bonaparte spoke. Herein lies the reason for the dramatic cess of all the religious enterprise down the centuries. Their ability to so effectively arouse guilt and then offer redemption quickly to assuage it. Time after time after time. So that we're kept on an endless roller coaster of emotion from guilt and sin up to redemption and soon are plunged back down again into guilt and sorrow, lest we become too complacent. <laughs>
This is the defining picture of Jesus that is most successfully marketed today and it is the defining note of the Christianity that is on this earth at the present time. Now, has anyone ever asked, where did all this come from? How did it happen? How has religion become so inextricably linked up with guilt and suffering that it's almost impossible to think of Christianity nowadays in any other way? It's not too hard to see how this happened. But it happened so long ago that it's now taken for granted as part of the original revelation and therefore unquestionable. Now let's take a quick look back at the history of Judaism and Christianity to see how this suffering, goring, bloody Jesus arose along with the guilt that's aroused in you and me by contemplating it. It goes right back to the very beginnings of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. Back to the Garden of Eden when the first parents, Adam and Eve, were placed in a blissful state by God. In the book of Genesis, our first parents, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, are pictured as being in a state of absolute bliss. Apparently they are immortal. They have no pain, sickness or disease and everything as just as it ought to be. However, there was one caveat. They were given a commandment by God not to eat the fruit of a particular tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now you would have imagined that instead of prohibiting the investigation of the knowledge of good and evil, that God would have actually wished for his creatures to advance in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And here we begin, for the first time, to find some hint about what kind of God actually lies behind the tradition of Genesis. Of course, forbidden fruit is an almost inescapable temptation. And the inevitable happened. Adam and Eve did eat the fruit. The serpent is supposed to have tempted Eve, and Eve tempted Adam. But who made the serpent is, of course, the real question here. According to the account in the book of Genesis, our first parents were cast out of the state of bliss after they had sinned. They were now prone to sickness, to aging, to disease. They were given a very short lifespan, simply because they had sought for the knowledge of what was good and what was evil. Was this being, who was so jealous of this, afraid for his own position, or what? What kind of God would punish his own creatures for trying to evolve and develop in accordance with the faculties with which they had been endowed by he himself. This is indeed a strange picture of God, but that's a subject for another day. Now let's concentrate on one specific issue in this whole picture. The Jews felt that they had to make up to God for this primordial sin in the Garden of Eden. And in their religious rituals, they devised a festival each year called the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was when they recalled that primordial sin we're told about in Genesis. They confessed their unworthiness before God and they acknowledged their sin. Well, what is sin? If we look forward to the New Testament, sin is conveyed in the Greek word hamartia, which means missing the mark, a term borrowed from archery. But sin is not a term that conveys horrible guilt and banishment. It's simply that you have missed the target. You must correct your aim to approach 
closer to the mark the next time you try. This is what sin really meant at the heart of the Old Testament tradition and at the very center of the New Testament. But of course, it became immensely corrupted when sin became misinterpreted as offering an insult to God, who must surely be very insecure to have been insulted by something his own creatures had done. In fact, the image of God that we find in what Christians call the Old Testament is very, very interesting. Now this is evidence you don't have to go to a dusty cave in Egypt to find or some archaeological site elsewhere. It's in every bedside locker in every hotel and motel room in the country. And the God that glowers out at us from the pages of the Old Testament is fickle, capricious, vindictive, insecure, psychotic and neurotic. The evidence is there. Open the pages. Read it for yourself. Nobody can deny those qualities that I've expressed. They're there. So this is the type of God that the Jewish people attempted to placate in their annual festival of Yom Kippur. And since they believed that every human person was corrupted by the taint of the sin of our first parents, no human being could hope to make up to God for the terrible offences of Adam and Eve and all that had happened since then. So they decided that they should select instead two perfect animals to stand in for them because these animals were not tainted by the sins of the human race. The animals they selected for Yom Kippur were first of all a goat, perfect without spot or blemish, and the other animal was a perfect lamb. Now in the ceremonials of Yom Kippur at the temple, the people confessed their unworthiness before God and their absolute sinfulness. They apologized for the offenses and the insults they had offered to God and then the goat was laden up with symbolic baggage to represent the sins of the people. The goat was driven out into the wilderness of Judea, symbolizing the taking away of the people's sin. The second ritual in the festival of Yom Kippur was the sacrifice of the spotless lamb on the altar in the temple. It was to appease the vengeful anger of God against humanity. Now what kind of God, we must ask, requires a sacrifice of life and has to be appeased from taking human life by the offering of an innocent animal? The goat and lamb are the two symbols of Yom Kippur. Remember we're trying to understand how Jesus and Christianity became so identified with guilt and suffering. Now you have the opportunity to understand why. Place yourself in the position of Christ's apostles. They spent three years with him. They saw him walk on water. They saw him multiply the loaves and fishes above the lake of Galilee and feed 5,000 people. They saw him heal the sick at a touch they saw him raise the dead. They, they heard him preach a message of liberation and freedom that totally moved past the antiquated and time-conditioned versions of the God they had known. Now what were they going to make of this man? How could they speak of him? How could they tell his story and do justice to what he was? Where were the images? Where were the blueprints that they could fill with this message. And then the brilliant idea came. Jesus is the quintessential lamb and the quintessential goat of Yom Kippur. He is the one who now 
makes it unnecessary to repeat this ceremonial every year. He is the one who takes the burden of our sins on his back, quintessentially, once and for all. It's done, it's finished. He is the one who is sacrificed on the altar of the cross to satisfy God's bloodthirsty vengeance and our debt to Satan in which the human race stands. Again, we have to ask, what kind of God would demand this or allow such a Satan? Many people blame the Emperor Constantine for the fact that Christianity took a wrong turn at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. But I assure you, the damage was done three centuries before Constantine ever drew a breath. The damage was done in the time of Jesus' own apostles because some of them tried to squash the magnificence of what he really was into those narrow confines, those limited molds of being the quintessential goat and lamb of Yom Kippur. And it was at that time, very early on, that Jesus first became seen as a rescuer as, and as a saviour who came to intercede and to intervene between God's vengeance and us to help a human race that needed rescuing. Of course, the matter escalated as the years went by, so nowadays it's hard to think of Jesus or indeed to think of Christianity as a whole without thinking of the suffering Saviour and without thinking of our guilt as a race which has constantly to be assuaged in the eyes of God. That is the heart of most present-day religion. It's what drives the engines of religion. But most assuredly, it is certainly not what the true Jesus was and is. And that's why I say that the greatest casualty of all the casualties that the Hamburger Universe mentality inflicts on us today is the way in which we understand Jesus the Christ. He was one of the most magnificent beings that ever walked this earth. But what's even more significant is that he carried a sublime message for our own evolution. And this has got lost in the distortions to which he and his message have never failed to be subjected to down the centuries. Everyone sees Jesus through their own eyes. Everyone interprets Jesus in the light of their own problems. But the true message of Jesus is as relevant and as liberating for us today as could ever be. And yet what we're getting now is a censored, shrunken, minimized caricature of what he truly was. The churches of the West have always seen the center of Jesus' work to consist in saving us from God or Satan and paying a dire penalty in the process for doing so. The churches of the East are far closer to the mark because they have always seen the work of Jesus as bringing about a process of divinization in us. That is, in bringing about a turning of mere human beings into the divine. That's much closer to the mark. I have gone into this long discourse to try to provide some sense of what Nicholas Nodovich and his scrolls and the people who believed in him were subjected to such ridicule, such attempt at suppression. I mean, how many people today have actually heard about the existence of these scrolls? which came to light only just a hundred years ago. 
and were widespread in all of the French and English-speaking worlds. How have they totally disappeared from the scene so that only a few odd individuals have heard about them today? Where is the deep deception coming from? The most interesting question of all about Jesus, of course, once your eyes start to be opened, is to ask, how did he become the Christ? Because he was not parachuted, fully formed and ready-made as the divine being into this world by God, as most of the churches have constantly proclaimed. The answers to how Jesus became the Christ will be very revealing and obviously absolutely central to us on our own spiritual journey. So with that question in mind, let's return to the information provided in Notovich's scrolls and other sources that expose a much greater knowledge than is provided in the bare essentials of the New Testament. Now, in the Notovich scrolls, Jesus was known by the name Isa, which is exactly the same name by which Jesus is known in the modern Irish language today. The Irish language comes from the Indo-European area. And the account in the scrolls of Notovich tells how Jesus had just celebrated his bar mitzvah. And that was the time when Jewish families liked to decide on a future spouse for their sons. According to the scrolls, Jesus did not wish for that to happen at that time. So he left his parents' home by stealth and joined a merchant caravan setting out for the fabled lands of the East, from whence had come these fabled stories of the great masters who could perform remarkable phenomena and live for unimaginable lengths of years. On his outward journey, he would have travelled north through the present-day city of Damascus in Syria, on into present-day Iraq, through Baghdad, then called Opis, and from there to Egbatana, now called Hamadan, and Rage, now called Tehran, the capital of Iran. On throughout northern Persia, as it was called in those days. From there he travelled along the fabled Silk Road from the Persian city of Rage, now Tehran, to the ancient city of Bactra, called Bart today, which had been the capital of an ancient empire. From Bactra he went south to Kabul in Afghanistan. In these days, unfortunately, very well known to everyone courtesy of CNN and from there through the Khyber Pass south to Taxila, the city of stone, capital of the Punjab, where Thomas the Apostle 20 years later had his sojourn with King Gundafaris in the year 47, a time when Apollonius of Tyana was also there at his court. Jesus travelled into, into the Raul Pindi area and headed for India. He crossed the land of the five rivers, the Punjab, until he reached the land of the Sindh, in present-day southeast Pakistan, at the mouth of the Indus River, where he settled among the people known as the Aryans. He was warmly welcomed. And after spending a time there, he became quite famous among all the local inhabitants. And despite their pleas to remain with them, he hadn't found what he wished to discover. So he moved on, right across the entire country of India, to the city of Juggernaut, now called Puri, in the province of Orissa, where he was warmly welcomed by the Brahmin white priests.
There the scrolls tell us that he learned to read and understand the Vedas, the sacred texts of the Hindus, which had been compiled between 500 and 1100 before Christ. The Vedas, principally the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, were not meant for casual reading. In the beginning they were composed of 1,000 hymns which served the priestly families, followed by the Veda of chants with musical notation, probably the world's oldest music for the performance of sacred songs. And this was followed by prose works added to explain the ceremonies. Over the centuries, of course, the Vedic rites had become so complicated that only trained specialists could understand them. One can only imagine how far this was from what Jesus had left home and endured such a major journey in order to find. Now, in those days, of course, India was rigidly divided by the caste system. At the top, you had the Brahmins, or the priests. The Brahmins taught Jesus the theory of healing by prayer and how to drive out spirits to restore people to sanity. He was greatly loved by all who met him. According to the scrolls of Notovich, and he spent six years in all at those sacred cities of Juggernaut and Rajagriha, about 400 miles northwest of present day Calcutta, and at the sacred city of Benares, now known as Varanasi. India at that time, as I said, was very rigidly divided by the caste system. At the top you had the priests, the Brahmins, below them you had the warriors, below them the merchants, and below them at the very bottom the Shudras, the workers, who were destined to serve all their lives as slaves to the upper three classes. This lowest class was not allowed to hear the Vedas or to contemplate them. The merchant classes were only allowed to hear them on feast days. But Jesus broke these rules by teaching the Hindu scriptures to the very lowest classes at all times and places. And he strongly spoke out against the Brahmins and the warriors for depriving the lower classes of their rights as human beings. God the Father, he said, makes no difference between his children. All are equally dear to him. Isn't it exactly the same point made to all comers by Ramtha at New Year's Eve on Broadway in New York when he said, the power is within you. Jesus really set the cat among the pigeons when he started to deny the divine origin of the Vedas. And he denied also that Parabrahma had incarnated in Vishnu, Shiva, and other gods. The Hindus had filled their temples with abominations, he said, worshipping a crowd of creatures, animals, stones, and metals, while subjugating the human person. He said it was an abomination to humiliate those who worked by the sweat of their brows in order to enable, quote, an idler to sit at his sumptuous board. The warriors and the priests, he said, will become the workers, and the workers will become dwellers with the eternal. So greatly encouraged by this, the lower classes, the merchants and the workers, asked Jesus how they should pray. And he said, Do not worship the idols because they cannot hear you. Do not listen to the Vedas because their truth is counterfeit. Do not humiliate your neighbor. Help the poor. Support the weak. And do not covet or do ill. A message he was later to resoundingly, resoundingly pronounce in the Holy Land some years later. Because of all this subversive teaching, which was subverting the people, the white priests and the warriors decided they were going to kill him. This took place in the city of Juggernaut, 
But he was warned of their plot and fled by night into the mountains. He travelled through Rajagriha, now Rajir, and eventually, eventually reached Kapilavastu, about 800 miles away, the birthplace of Gautama, the most famous of the Buddhas. It was here he learned the ancient language of Pali, which had been the language of Buddha Gautama, and applied himself to the study of the sutras, which are subtitled The Way of Truth or The Path of Truth. These texts recorded conversations the Buddha had when he was teaching. They were recorded on palm leaves, and the leaves were gathered in three woven baskets. The first basket was called the Sut Sutta Pikata, the basket of discourse, and is attributed directly to the Buddha himself. After this, Jesus then went north. After his stay at Kapilavastu, and he passed on the western side of Mount Everest and journeyed on into Nepal and Tibet and stopped at its capital, Lhasa, where the palace of the Dalai Lama was built in the 17th century. He spent another six years with the masters in those mountainous regions. And there, I imagine, he found much more that was to his liking. In his 26th year, Jesus turned towards the west again and headed for home. Everywhere on the journey, his history repeated itself. He preached against idolatry, sided with the oppressed and the poor, and eventually managed to upset every entrenched religious leader that there was, particularly in Persia. The priests of Zoroaster forbade the people to listen to him. They arrested Jesus and brought him before the Zoroastrian high priest, who interrogated him. Things eventually reached such a pitch that the priests of Zoroaster cast him out into the wilderness one night near the lair of savage beasts, hoping he would be eaten by them, but he escaped unharmed. Finally, he reached his homeland at the age of 29. He had been gone for so long that nobody recognized him or even knew who he was. The Jewish priests and elders were filled with admiration for his teachings. And they asked if it was true that he had tried to stir up the people against the authorities, as had been notified about him to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. He said... I was painfully grieved when I saw how my brothers and sisters had forgotten the true God. I tried to re-establish the law of Moses in people's hearts because they are in ignorance of its true meaning. The laws have been perverted. Now a great deal of what we read in the Isa scrolls of Nicholas Notovich squares with what we know from the New Testament about the life of of Jesus during his time in the Holy Land. But there are some major differences. All of the four Gospels of the New Testament blame the Jews for the death of Jesus. But the scrolls lay the blame fairly and squarely at the feet of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, alone. In fact, the scrolls credit the Jewish authorities with going out of their way to save Jesus. Also, John the Baptist is not mentioned at all in the Notovich scrolls. Another major teaching that is quite alien to the message of the four Gospels of the New Testament and quite needed today is the beautiful hymn of praise for women which Jesus uttered when one of the spies of Pilate, sent to keep track of him, roughly pushed an old woman out of the way so he could get closer to the master and not miss any sedition that he might speak. Jesus said, Whoever respects not his mother, the most sacred being after his God, is unworthy of the name of of son. Respect woman, for she is the mother of the universe. 
and all the truth of divine creation lies in her. She is the basis of all that is good and beautiful, as she is also the germ of life and death. She gives birth to you in the midst of suffering. By the sweat of her brow she raises you, and until her death you cause her the gravest anxieties. Bless her and worship her, for she is your one true friend, your one support on earth. And in the same way, love your wives and respect them, for they will be mothers tomorrow, and each later on the ancestress of her race. Be lenient towards women, for woman's love ennobles man, softens his hardened heart, tames the brute in him, and makes of him a lamb. The wife and the mother are the unappreciable treasures given unto you by God. Protect your wife in order that she may protect you and all the family. All that you do for your wife, for your mother, or for a widow, you have done unto your God. A number of Jewish scholars have been arguing that the Gospels of the New Testament were in fact Gentile or Western documents in terms of their formulation and orientation. With the exception of the Gospel of St. Mark, they were written after the fall of Jerusalem in the year 70. So for all intents and purposes, the Jewish nation was no longer a force to be reckoned with. It was Rome that needed to be watched. And most scholars believe that the Gospels were formulated with that end in view, to help spread the teachings of Jesus to the Greeks and to the Romans of the western part of the empire. It has been suggested that the Gospels subtly shifted the blame for the death of Jesus away from the Romans and laid it on the Jews so as not to upset the powers that were or the new people to whom they were now preaching. We're all too tragically well aware of the curse of anti-Semitism which plagued Europe for 1500 years and was in large degree due to Christian hostility to Judaism because they blamed it for the crucifixion of the Christ. All that had come about because of where the blame had been placed for the death of Jesus. How much suffering, how much injustice would have been saved over the centuries if the teachings contained in these Easter scrolls had held sway instead of the familiar Christian tradition of the New Testament. If these scrolls of the life of Jesus in India had never existed, we would still have to ask penetrating questions about a possible acquaintance with Buddhist teaching because of the character of the teachings of Jesus himself. Nobody can deny that the God of the Old Testament is harsh and vindictive, but the God preached by Jesus is of an entirely different kind to the God of the Jewish tradition in which Jesus himself stood. So, has it ever occurred to you to ask where did this new message that he preached come from? Or was it parachuted directly with him down from heaven by God? as the devotees of the Hamburger Universe mindset will maintain? No, there's a much more obvious and less exotic explanation to which I will return shortly. But for the moment, let us now look at the second great gap in the life history of Jesus, his time in Egypt. Because the symbols and the practices that he knew there will give us an enormous insight to the true meaning of his teaching.